everybody. We're just going to get started shortly. All right, I think we're, we're good to go. We're just letting in the final few people into the waiting room. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. So, Jennifer, if you can go ahead and stop the screen share. So, welcome, everybody. My name is Debbie Kavnis. I am the Alumni Director here at SUNY ESF, and I'm very pleased that you could all join us this evening for a very special presentation. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody knows um, that we have the chat box going. So while we have a lot of people on this Zoom call this evening, so we will not be able to have people ask questions with a mic. But if you have questions, please feel free to put them into the chat. Um, once Dr. Gibbs is finished with his presentation, we'll go to the chat box and try and get to as many questions as we possibly can. So again, thank you for joining us this evening um, for this very special presentation of ESF Connected um, featuring Dr. James Gibbs and the Galapagos tortoise. So this evening we are very uh, pleased to have a, a very special host. I know he's a favorite of everybody's. Um, so I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Don Leopold, who is a uh, distinguished teaching professor here at the college and also a co-director for, um, for the Restoration Science Center. So Don, welcome. Thank you, Debbie, for the introduction. And uh, thank you especially for the opportunity for Dr. Gibbs to talk about one of his many projects as, uh, and, and to also to highlight the Restoration Science Center, a fairly new structure on the ESF campus. Uh, the Restoration Science Center at ESF is it's a highly unique research and educational program that includes over 25 faculty among all seven academic departments at ESF. Although the college covers the faculty positions, external support is necessary to cover the management, research, and educational programs of the RSC. The event tonight is highlighting the international component of the, of the RSC, of which James is the foundation. And this is just one of many really incredible projects that he's involved in uh, internationally. So it's with uh, great pleasure that I get to introduce uh, Dr. James Gibbs. Dr. Gibbs is a world-class scientist, exceptional teacher, highly awarded and valued colleague. He is currently distinguished professor of conservation biology in the department of now environmental biology. His grantsmanship and scholarship are extraordinary, simply the best of all faculty at ESF. Uh, just, last, just last week, I think NASA found out about this presentation. NASA contacted him to tell him that a proposal he submitted months ago was just funded for four years, $777,000, and it's to help with the rewilding of the Galapagos giant tortoise. A numerous key books in the field of conservation biology and NSF grants are among his many accomplishments. And there are a few faculty at ESF as effective in the classroom as James. It would take the rest of the time of the program tonight to go on about how much James has enriched ESF and, and my life professionally. James has made over 50 trips to the Galapagos. Perhaps the best way to note how significant his work in the Galapagos over decades has been is to tell you that in March of 2013, he was asked by the Ecuadorian government to escort Lonesome George from Ecuador to the American Museum of Natural History after performing the necropsy of the tortoise the previous summer. The book that James will highlight tonight is the best summary of what he and his colleagues have been doing for the conservation of the Galapagos tortoises and the islands that support these magnificent creatures. So it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. James Gibbs. James? Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, Don, for that kind introduction. And I'm delighted um, that so many of you joined this evening and delighted to have this opportunity to share with you 
well, the highlights of uh, 25 years, I guess, of ESF's involvement with uh, restoring um, uh, some charismatic uh, creatures for a variety of reasons uh, that we'll get into uh, in, in this extraordinary place, the Galapagos, uh, very much uh, uh, central to the, the, the mission and, uh, and goals of, uh, of ESF's new Restoration Science Center. Um, just to get us uh, uh, going here, I uh, put us on a map um, and uh, we are uh, gonna focus on some extraordinary creatures, Galapagos giant tortoises, uh, part of the um, uh, unique endemic to this uh, archipelago, the Galapagos archipelago here, just a, a map so you can see us up way up here in, in, in New York. Um, uh, and uh, uh, it's a thousand kilometers off the west coast of, of Ecuador. And um, it is so named for its most famous resident and those are the giant tortoise. Galapagos is an old Spanish word for, for tortoise. And um, these are uh, really quite remarkable creatures. Uh, they are indeed uh, well-named. They're quite gigantic. Um, we recently weighed one that we couldn't believe was 862 pounds. Um, granted, that's an extreme one, but they, they, um, they, their gigantism serves them very well um, in terms of uh, their ability to survive in this extremely austere uh, environment. They can store water, fat, sometimes not eat regularly for six months a year, but, but uh, um, sometimes to skip a year um, just with this, this massive uh, uh, body that lets them store so much. So they're mostly arid zone creatures. Uh, this, is, this is one of the, uh, but uh, Galapagos is mostly arid, but then they also occur on the tops of volcanoes, which are, tend to be more moist. They are unusual around the world in their gigantism, but they're also, the males tend to be much larger than the females, which also sets them apart from many other, uh, many other turtles. Um, and uh, uh, they, are, uh, they are the only large native herbivore that ever made it to Galapagos. So there's no mammals, um, uh, large bodied mammals to speak of. They filled the niche and they are indeed uh, prolific herbivores um, eating, uh, immense amounts of, of, uh, of herbaceous material, um, foliage every year, um, and uh, strict vegetarians. Um, but when you combine this with uh, all of their, their, their size, their, <clears throat> uh, their numbers, their actually capacity to move, these are highly mobile reptiles. They are often migrating tens of kilometers every, every year, moving a lot of seeds. They, they become a major force in, in the ecosystem. Uh, very much engineering plant communities. Um, and so they are uh, um, not, uh, and also in, this is just a, a white water pool that these are using uh, just in their comings and goings. They've slowly excavated this um, pool over the years, over the millennia, but um, they are interesting animals. Uh, uh, they are ecologically important animals. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, another dimension to their, um, interest and, and the rationale for restoring them are their economic importance. They are um, uh, the primary target for ecotourists visiting Galapagos. So all the, the surveys of tourists uh, say, what, well, your primary reason to go to Galapagos to see one of these animals. Uh, Pre-pandemic, pre it was uh, almost a quarter of a million people um, visiting every year, leaving on, in aggregate about a billion dollars uh, uh, and with tortoises sort of being the focus uh, of uh, a primary focus. So there's a whole bunch of reasons here um, to, uh, to, to focus on this group. It is actually a group of species. Um, it's uh, yeah, a lot of folks uh, uh, think of them as the Galapagos tortoise, but there's actually 15 distinct species and maybe, maybe a couple more. Um, each one sort of distributed uh, on its own particular island or its own particular volcano. And um, they are uh, really quite uh, quite uh, um, distinct, um, and they um, and they, uh, they 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 do represent different species, um, and each of them is represents basically a, a, a has its own story, and that's really like what I like to focus on today is um, um, a many different uh, flavors and forms that uh, uh, that uh, that applying science to conservation involves. Um, 
and looking at each, I'm going to highlight a few of these uh, these case studies because each species has its own issues and its own solutions, its own challenges, and its own opportunities for restoring them. And just sort of walk you through not all, but uh, some of the some of the, the, the primary ones here. And uh, this has been a great uh, adventure in uh, application of science to, to conservation. We've had some great enormous surprises here as we've um, um, moved moved through here. So um, just a, a little bit of a background here. Um, the uh, um, just sort of a timeline here of the history of this. Um, uh, each of these, uh, this is time from 1500 to, uh, to the present. Um, and just focus on this side, uh, the, the historical dimension here. We think there were once over 300,000 tortoises in the Galapagos. Each tortoise here represents 10,000. Um, and what you see here is a, just a precipitous uh, collapse um, of tortoises um, uh, in around the, the 1800s, essentially, up to the mid 1800s, um, and bringing us to near near extinction uh, across all of those all of them in uh, in the mid 1900s, and then now today to this to this beginning of this uh, of the slow path to recovery, which really we'll focus on today. Um, but this. Um, this is the period I uh, just want to talk about here that's affected all tortoises uh, on all islands and um, and represents um, uh, this is primarily the result of uh, depredations for many, many decades uh, upon these animals. Um, pretty much the whole uh, maritime industry in the Pacific depended on the, the meat and fat of tortoises, the entire sperm whale industry. A lot of the gold rush was uh, uh, kept to California. Uh, uh, relied very heavily on these animals. They're apparently very delicious. They're extremely um, storable prior to the age of refrigeration. They can be kept below decks for a year without food or water and, uh, and mustered up for, uh, for, for dinner. They were a, a major source of, uh, of food for many, many, many countless, we think at least a couple hundred thousand were removed it's just an image from uh, from the about 1910 uh, of a watering hole where these all animals. There's no uh, essentially no tortoises left on this particular volcano today, um, but these animals had come down for a drink of water and been slaughtered for uh, the fat on their plastrons, their lower shells that was used to uh, be rendered for oil to re to light street lamps, um, and that was uh, a lot of this plundering uh, scientists uh, when they heard that the final. Um, that many of these uh, species were going extinct also made multiple expeditions and California Academy of Sciences, we um, uh, here taking some of the last uh, tortoises from some of the populations. So this was the real calamitous um, uh, sort of uh, part of the history of these animals that brings us to today. These are these little stylized tortoises show you um, the, the dark points are where we where there are tortoises today and the light points are where we, um, where we think they once were, but they, but they, but are no longer. And this is, in another sense, what we're hoping someday to uh, to restore them to. It's sort of the blueprint for 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 um, full restoration. So how do we get there? Well, it is one island at a time. Um, each of them has their own issues and and and, and problems. And um, um, to do this, we established. Uh, what was called the uh, the Giant Tortoise Restoration Initiative. This is uh, this is all primarily the work of the Galapagos National Park, which has jurisdiction and authority uh, for for conservation and and, and management of, of tortoises and the entire biota of Galapagos. But um, receives a significant amount of um, financial support from the Galapagos Conservancy, and then. Um, I, along with, uh, uh, this is Washington Tapia, uh, my sort of partner, um, we co-lead this, uh, this initiative to, uh, to basically catalyze and or, uh, orient and advise the park in effective uh, management and, and ways ahead in terms of the restoration of this, of, of this group. And uh, that's the Giant Tortoise Restoration Initiative that, that does push this forward. And then, uh, so just to, to move, show you how this all works. Um, yeah, we do um, work every day uh, with the park, um, uh, coordinate with their annual operating plan, and uh, and uh, to to try and push ahead where 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 possible. 
um, different initiatives for each of these populations. So I'm gonna just give you some, some case studies here moving through the archipelago, some short to some, uh, some a little bit longer, but to, just to show you the, the, the many different forms that, uh, that, this, that this takes, um, this larger, larger goal of restoring the complex, but, but one island at a time and one volcano at a time. And uh, let's start with the, uh, uh, the uh, population. It's the uh, Chelonoides Vandenbergi. This is the, the Alcedo volcano uh, tortoise. And this is uh, Alcedo volcano. It's a, this is the top. It's a, a very um, a large caldera. And uh, it is, uh, it's been regarded as having one of the very largest populations uh, in the archipelago. Um, this, the problem in this, for this particular, particular population, which um, had been estimated to be about 4,000 giant tortoises, had been a legacy of these animals. These are, these are uh, goats um, uh, that have been left, well, they've actually been left, uh, um, introduced to the islands as a source of food for mariners over the years and just built into tremendous numbers. Um, I took this picture um, in 1994 and um, fairly typical, even I remember at this time, they're actually standing on the backs of the tortoises to get at what little vegetation remained. Um, just tremendous uh, densities of these animals. And ultimate consequence of this is just sort of uh, ecological devastation. This is a view um, uh, in the 1970s, prior to the arrival of goats, the sort of have, this is the exact same spot on the side of the caldera before and after. And, uh, and you can sort of see uh, for herbivores that require shade and, uh, and surfaces for water to condense upon and not to make even all of the remarkable plant diversity here, uh, um, uh, gigantic tree fern that uh, um, uh, the goats wrought this incredible ecological destruction. Basically the tortoises kind of had uh, few resources and uh, reproduction really slowed, growth slowed. Um, so the solution here was fairly straightforward. Um, the Galapagos National Park and with their um, uh, many partners are uh, ex uh, extraordinary at removing um, larger invasive species, larger bodies such as goats and were able to through a prolonged campaign uh, successfully remove all of those goats which were in the tens of thousands from this volcano and enable it to begin the process of restoration, uh, recovery on its own. So we just had an expedition go out the first time in um, in uh, 15 years to, to Alcedo to see what was going on. And they just were out in mid-January. So these are photographs from just a few weeks ago of the park guards um, um, checking on this population, seeing how it's doing. The vegetation is still uh, fairly uh, devastated, um, but it's recovering. Um, but this is just a little bit of a drone uh, image to show you, um, give you a sense of the the volcano, all of these are giant tortoises. You may see there, those sort of gleaming in the sunlight. These are the park rangers looking out, but just to give you a sense of uh, um, huge numbers of tortoises, um, their effects on the larger ecosystem in terms of shaping it and engineering it. Um, uh, and uh, you can't quite see, but large ones and small ones and lots of males and females. We had thought that there were only 4,000. We are still entering the data um, and analyzing. We, we're pretty convinced there's probably 15,000 uh, now, which is completely beyond anybody's expectation. Um, but this is just to give you a sense of, um, uh, this is one of the more straightforward restorations um, and uh, what's involved is just removing that one limiting factor. And this is a good look at the caldera. This has tortoises all over the edge of it on all the flanks and the park rangers were able to cover um, the entire volcano in about uh, 15 days of, of hard work. So um, that's Alcedo, um, uh, another population with a very specific limiting factor, a very different one is this one. It's a uh, Pinzon Island, which is, uh, has a very distinctive tortoise, um, a saddleback. It's this island right in the middle of the archipelago, you can see there, in, highlighted in red. Um, Pinzon is a very arid island. It's a low island, um, not like that tall volcano with that, uh, um, all that humid, uh, moist, ve moist zone vegetation. This is like a sort of a fortress, but it does have one access point and the whalers and others used this and took thousands of tortoises off the island. I'm leaving just basically uh, about 120, um, at which point the became so, so few and far between nobody really wanted to uh, 
to bother with them anymore. It just wasn't worth the effort. Um, and they had been essentially given up for extinction. So the pressures gave up on them about the mid 1800s, but uh, unfortunately around 1880, some, uh, some of the last visitors left something else and that was black rats. And uh, rats are, they, have, they exploded and they remarkably, um, as far as we know, they find every single um, hatchling that is produced by these tortoises and, and eat them, uh, every single one. In fact, not a single native hatchling had been seen uh, on this island since 1880. Um, in, uh, fortunately, in 1970s, the park went to harvest some eggs from nests knowing that there's no reproduction and uh, has been bringing them into captivity to hatch them there and then releasing the young one. They're a little bit larger, um, but uh, uh, basically this population is comprised of a bunch of very old geriatric tortoises that hadn't reproduced in over a hundred years. Um, working with Island Conservation, which is an NGO, uh, the park and uh, um, others have, were successful uh, about eight years ago in um, successfully exterminating rats across this fairly sizable island. It was a very complex undertaking. Um, and uh, a our follow-up trip the year later uh, was uh, we were remarkable. I found this particular tortoise, which is what you see here. It's not much. It's a it's a new new hatchling. It's very squishy, a soft, but it represented the first hatchling, you know, ever found in, in over 120 years. So we're eager to get back um, and uh, and see uh, how recruitment is doing. Um, and uh, it's uh, complicated to, to do these expeditions, but um, this removal of this rat predation let this population now. Um, basically probably sustain itself and it will need no further attention with this. So, uh, and we're, we're very, again, eager to see how it's doing um, now, seven, eight years later. And hopefully there's a, a lot of these small ones out for the first time in over a century. Um, here's another, uh, just another case study. Uh, this is island of the island of Española with its very distinctive uh, unique species, Hudensis, um, a very uh, settled back way down here in the south eastern corner of the archipelago. Unfortunately, a low island that was uh, the first place ships coming prior to the Panama Canal coming down around uh, Cape Horn coming up, basically getting to the archipelago starving, leaving places like Long Island or New England six months previously. And uh, they would, they plundered this island of its tortoises. This is a low dry island, as I mentioned, one of the few anchorages that you can see here. Um, these are just to give you a sense of the habitat and the area. And this is this, uh, the, the, the endemic species. This is the, uh, the Española giant tortoise with its very, uh, very striking um, saddleback uh, promontory to its shell, um, striking yellow throat. Um, so uh, sadly, these animals actually had been given up as extinct. Um, by 1960 when the Galapagos National Park Service. It was you can, uh, many, many writings of sad, it's tragic, but they're gone. Um, but the first park uh, director and others said, Let's, we should just go check. And they found a, one tortoise here, one tortoise there, all of them scattered. They hadn't found one another and, and ended up finding just 14 um, remaining for this species that was once in the many thousands. And they also found that one other tortoise here and uh, had been taken off the island in 1934 and taken to San Diego. Um, and this, here he is. Um, and this is him coming back in 1972 or so to, um, to Galapagos and climbing out of his crate um, and uh, joining those 14 to, 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 to create this group of four, 15 tortoises um, that, um, and uh, so this is actually uh, that formed this, this core breeding group. So this is actually Diego from San Diego, the tortoise we were just looking at, taken off the 1934. He's been a prolific breeder. He still is. Um, and um, they really do well in captivity, mainly because there's so much. Uh, life is hard in, 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 in the wild. Um, they're given regular food and water, and they tend to, uh, to thrive in captivity. Um, and so between that and um, giving them a little assistance, and this is uh, um, harvesting their eggs from the nest they lay in captivity, and then actually doing the incubation in incubators. And this is not a product placement. This is a, the incubators. Um, we have revolutionized the incubator process in, in, uh, in Galapagos with an ESF alum, Preston Bruin, 
uh, whose company um, in Thornwood, New York, has uh, created a new generation of incubators that is now producing thousands of young tortoises. But uh, this has basically boosts their survival from 2% to 95, 98%, which is enormous. Um, and so then these, they hatch in captivity. They're not depredated by anything. Um, they're fed well, and this is so, uh, this is sort of the corrals, the pens for the zero to five-year-olds. Um, there's many thousands of these in captivity. And when they get to age five, getting a regular square meal twice a week and as much water as they can drink, um, they then get to age five when they're really, uh, they're, they're rat proof. They are, um, they're, much, they're much more vigorous uh, and they are basically head started and ready to go. And so there are episodic releases and liberations or repatriations of these, these are Espanola tortoises, um, back to these islands where the problems have been fixed. And, in this, uh, and that's what you see here. These are tortoises uh, being released, um, Espanola tortoises and going back to their populations. So remarkably, these um, uh, we are seeing now, um, this is actually one of the, the earliest releases of, um, of a hatchling of those 15 surviving tortoises, including Diego. And this, was, this was number 12, so this was offspring number 12 back from Mike in 1970, but this is about uh, 30 years later, and now it's a very large one. Um, and uh, we're seeing this a lot, a lot of those early ones, now there's, there's lots of, of large, and they're basically becoming into reproductive age. And a lot of our job as technical advisors is to understand what's going on and all the monitoring and all the synthesis. And, uh, but now we, we recently found these, which are native hatchlings, the first ones on the island that have been seen in 100 years or more. Um, and these are then the offspring of the offspring. They're grandchildren of Diego, if you will. Sorry for the anthropomorphization, but these are the, the second generation. And now there's lots and lots of these. So the decision was recently made, this is June of last year, was, well, um, you know, maybe they don't need help anymore. Those 15 produced over 2,000 offspring. Those offspring have all done very well. They're growing, they're reproducing now on their own. Let's take those, uh, let's take those 15 home and call this a success. Um, and so that was done. This was uh, June 15th last year. This is actually Diego. It's not easy to carry a tortoise up a small volcano, um, but this is um, going back home. The first time he's been home since 1934. These are the different, most of these are females being, uh, being released. Um, just remarkable, these animals, <laughs> you would think they would be traumatized from, uh, but they're instantly untied and uh, they're already having their own social uh, spats, which they, they do, uh, but they, they adapt very quickly and readily to, to the environment. They're, they're, um, and so, yeah, I, uh, this is Diego now. Um, this is in last June, and he's the last time he was on here was 1934. He had quite a journey in between, over 2,000 uh, grandkids, and they're all doing very well. And so there's, an, who knows what's going on? He actually does have a small satellite uh, tracker on him. I follow him every day. See, and he's extremely vigorous. And uh, I don't know how old he is. He was old in 1934, so he's probably 140, 100, uh, but he's, he's doing extremely well. Um, so just very, uh, this is, the tortoises are doing the work. We're just helping them, um, uh, but by removing these limiting factors. Not all is well, a um, hundred years of, or more of no tortoises. Um, the vegetation has changed profoundly on the island. It's, there's a huge incursion of woody vegetation, which tortoises are going to take them a very long time to push it back, convert it to the savanna, grasses and short woody plants and nice mix that, uh, um, and uh, they're actually kind of stuck in some areas. That I think it'll be centuries before they can both their numbers recover and, the, and they sort of push the habitat back to what it once was. There's lots of consequences for other species. This particular island is the only one on the planet where this albatross, the waved albatross breeds. Um, and uh, the tortoises are starting to do good things for albatross habitat. Albatross, as you know, they're fabulous flyers, but they can't really cope with this, um, um, this dense woody vegetation. They, they, they themselves walk for kilometers um, to get to cliff edges so they can get away from this woody vegetation and take off. Um, but my point is the tortoises will eventually probably have a constructive um, impact on this entire ecosystem. So that's the story of Española. Here's another one um, that's actually related to what we were just uh, 
um, discussing for <clears throat> Espanola here is uh, Santa Fe. And this is a sort of sad situation where this is one of the smallest islands that ever had tortoises and they're gone. They're, there's no, no one has any um, notion that they might still be some somewhere. It's a lovely island, um, fairly low. Again, low, small meant that it was heavily depredated by whalers and others. Um, this is it today, um, you can see. Um, and uh, there are remains of tortoises. We can extract DNA from these and they're absolutely a, a distinct, uh, our, our collaborators at Yale do all of the, the genetics work, Gisela Coconi and others, and absolutely it's a distinct species. Um, but what do you do? The, again, um, tortoises are interesting. Uh, they're important, but they do important things in the ecosystem, especially uh, dispersal of plants and keystone species such as arboreal cacti that basically sustain the whole animal community. The island needs uh, tortoises back again. So actually the habitat is there, but the tortoises aren't. This is just a good example of these spectacular arboreal cacti, but there's no little ones around. You can see there's not, there's, oh, there's a few, uh, but uh, um, this is not what you see in an area where you have um, uh, a lot of tortoises, you get a lot of regeneration. And so um, what do we do? Well, actually it turns out that that, uh, that those extinct giant tortoises and from those bone fragments, we finally extract the DNA. They're very similar to, but not the same as those Espanola tortoises. And the Espanola tortoises have really covered pretty well. They got a ways to go, but they're, they can, um, why don't we bring in some of those? Um, and uh, use them as an analog species, if you will, uh, surrogate. And that is what has been done. The park uh, decided to move in this direction. They both have been sort of redirected uh, some of the young from the captive breeding operation to, to Santa Fe Island. Also brought in a few after a prolonged quarantine period from Espanola Island and uh, introduced them to um, Santa Fe Island. And this is uh, it's actually a ESF graduate student, Harrison, Goldspiel here in Wachitapia, the direct, uh, director of the GTRI, and releasing some of these animals from uh, brought in by helicopter. Um, but uh, these are all doing fabulously well, way beyond our expectation. They have a 99% survival rate, very fast growth, and they are going to be a reproductive age very, very soon. And so this had been planned to be a 10 to 15 year process. It's actually um, been terminated. Um, uh, as of last Friday, uh, just get, we do have a big program in place to monitor uh, the effects of these tortoises on the plant communities of the many other species. Uh, there's other endemic species on this island, a land iguana, a rice rat, a gecko, uh, but we have a whole series of exposures here, sort of like you'd build it for deer, but to measure how the tortoises are changing, change the, the plant communities and, um, and um, but uh, as of last, this is, these are photos from four days ago. Uh, the decision was made that these tortoises are doing so well. Um, let's uh, release the final Espanola tortoises and let them, um, let them take it from here. And so this is what you see here. This is landing at uh, the Cove El Miedo and then climbing up to the top and uh, starting a long trek uh, with these boxes full of the last of the Espanola tortoises to be taken up and released uh, up in the middle of the island. Um, a very long day for the tortoises and the park rangers. Uh, but as of last Friday, this is, um, this is uh, so this is, this is the situation. So we've released 700 of them. They're growing well, they're surviving well. And um, this decision has been made to now let them take over from here, uh, albeit with regular monitoring trips once a year to see what's going on and, and uh, how they're doing. One other quick um, uh, case study here, and then I'll, I'll move to a sort of a final, more complicated one. And that has to do with this uh, enormous surprise that we're dealing with uh, for the uh, uh, Fernandina Island tortoise. Uh, this is Kelanoides fantasticus, well-named. I'll show you in just a moment for a fantastically formed uh, tortoise. So Fernandina Island is right here. These are islands are, the, the archipelago, it's extremely volcanically active. They're emerging they're, uh, and uh, these are very young. Some of them is uh, less than half a million years old. Um, they're, all of these are active volcanoes and then they're sort of getting older and, and, um, and getting lower and sort of sinking down under the sea as you go to the east. 
Uh, Fernandina is a very interesting island. It's been meant, said to be the largest pristine island on Earth. It's probably not entirely pristine, but it's, uh, um, it's extremely active volcanically, and it's one of the most inhospitable environments uh, on the planet. Very few people <laughs> visit Fernandina. It's just a uh, very, very difficult terrain, both slopes and uh, all this, this uh, volcanic terrain. It's very unstable. Um, and uh, distances, it's a, it's, a, it's a tough place to work. However, in um, 1906, uh, this is an, uh, just another look at, at, at the terrain of, of Fernandina, and just to give you a sense of this is just one, one side of it. Um, but there had been one single tortoise ever mentioned, ever collected um, uh, on this island. And here it is, this is a large male um, uh, collected in uh, the early 1900s. Um, and it does have a fantastic form, if you will, in terms of this pronounced saddleback and all these marginal scoots that are flared. And um, it had, um, it was killed <laughs> instantly and uh, put in the California Academy. And people have been looking, not many people get to Fernandina, but they've been looking ever since. And there's been some suggestion that maybe there could be other tortoises there. There's patches of habitat despite all the volcanism. Well, it just so happens two years ago was the opportunity to visit again for a short period. We've been talking, we really need to do a comprehensive survey of this volcano and just once and for all determine if there are or are not tortoises. Um, it's a centuries long mystery. And without any great amount of support, just a four day field trip, lo and behold, um, uh, in a very odd place tucked under a bush in a, a very remote part of the island found a it's the second only in exist, ever known to exist uh, tortoise. And this is a, a very old, uh, but quite fit female. She's quite small, but extremely old. You can tell by how shiny the sort of the patina she has on her shell. Um, and she was, uh, it was an enormous surprise. This was mainly a reconnaissance trip to scope out what would be involved in actually searching this island. And so here we have, she, here she is, she's a, um, uh, she's in captivity now because nobody might knows quite what to do. Um, there has been evidence of two other tortoises and we are now uh, really struggling with the next steps. Uh, this is potentially a population that's on its final, final legs because of natural threats, volcanism in this case, and it's down to one tortoise. And so we're scoping out how now to do uh, a full search uh, of this very inhospitable island, get into all these remaining patches of vegetation. We're pretty sure that there's got to be other tortoises, and then to make a decision to group them so they can find one another or bring them into captivity or what have you. But it's uh, it's still a, a, a big mystery. But uh, getting closer to resolving. But exactly how this will play out, uh, I'm not sure. We're down to one Fernandina tortoise on the planet now. Um, just to end here on a slightly longer case study, but just a, a really fascinating one, uh, probably the greatest surprise of 25 years of uh, um, working together um, uh, to, uh, on this effort uh, between geneticists and veterinarians and park managers, park rangers and uh, scientists and others uh, was this. Uh, these uh, two islands like Santa Fe, um, Floriana Island and Pinta Island, uh, once had tortoises and tremendous numbers of records of thousands and thousands of them, uh, both live and then removed by whalers, especially sealers, pirates, um, and basically given up in the case of Floriana as extinct in 1850. Darwin was one of the last people, Charles Darwin, when visiting to ever mention them. And then on Pinta, the last living tortoise individual had been found in, um, in 1970 and that went extinct uh, about 10 years ago, Lonesome, the famous Lonesome George uh, for 40 years in captivity as the, as the, the final uh, member of his species, sort of as a poster, poster child for conservation. But uh, no one really ever had any expectations that as much we can do about this, um, that these were long gone. So this is all we have really, or all we thought we had of Floriana tortoises were a few bits of bones and shells that you can still find in caves. And the famous Lonesome George, who here he is uh, in, in ensconced in his vitrine in the American Museum of Natural History, but he's now been returned to, uh, to, to, to Ecuador and to Galapagos where he's the focus of a 
a major visitor site, uh, sort of uh, the, the Hall of Hope to 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 have folks, you know, witness him and think about the meaning of extinction and and ultimately um, restoration um, and conservation. So, so the big surprise here is that um, we we these were extinct, but now we're in a process of potentially de-extinction for both of these in a, in a way that I never anticipated. And it has to do with this um, third site here, this uh, remote volcano here, uh, Volcan Wolf, on the very extreme uh, tip of Isabella Island, this large main island uh, in about 90 miles long, lengthwise here. Um, and this was a, it is a, uh, this is a Darwin, the near one, and Wolf is the far one. These are about, you know, proportionally speaking, not quite as tall as Mount Marcy, but they come straight out of the ocean. There's no, uh, and so they're, they're pretty substantial um, and uh, they're very remote. Uh, these are obviously just uh, poking their noses out over the, this cloud bank here, but um, rarely visit, there's no visitor sites actually on either of these. There's uh, very few people get to these. Um, and we had left uh, Wolf, Volcan Wolf, named after a famous volcanologist, Ecuadorian volcanologist, Wolf, um, as a last one to survey for giant tortoises. In a, and so this is what it's like to work on Wolf. This is uh, walking in from a shore camp or basically aiming to get up to the top of that lava flow. There's uh, me and Jeffries, uh, my uh, park guard, we work an awful lot together, um, but getting across uh, into this to and um, this is actually from the very top of that lava flow looking back down. So we were just sort of down here and um, you can get a sense of the scope and scale. When you get up on the sides of the volcano you can find hundreds and hundreds of tortoises. In fact, we've marked over 4,000 now and we, nobody had any idea how many there are. We think there's probably eight, maybe 12,000 up there. Um, just huge numbers of tortoises. And these are endemic and they're doing very well. And, uh, and that's, that's great. Um, what we never anticipated though in these courses of these surveys was uh, um, what we ended up uh, finding, you know, encountering again, thousands of tortoises, but then um, every once in a while encountering tortoises that just uh, in, in living in small groups all in the same little encanadas or little, little, little canyons, uh, slot canyons together. These, um, these very distinctly looking tortoises, distinct looking tortoises. This is, this is again, Jeffrey's Malaga park guard. Uh, um, and um, you don't need uh, molecular genetics um, to, uh, to know that there's something odd. Oh, this just does not look physically at all like the, those thousands of endemic tortoises. They're finding pockets and patches of these mostly down in the low areas um, uh, toward, toward the, the sea margin. And but taking blood samples and sending those off to our our colleagues at, at Yale uh, to do all the, the genetics work, finding that in fact they are the fact they 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 are tortoises from other parts of the archipelago, um, and uh, they actually the folks at Yale thought they had made had contaminated samples or something they reran, but now we know that these tortoises are are from multiple other populations, and we know now that they include a lot of. Um, descendants of tortoises from Floriana Island and a few from Pinta Island. And they're called aliens, um, but just because their genotypes are quite alien, as are their morphotypes or their shapes. And uh, this is, these are Floriana type tortoises and these are, this is a recent female we found recently uh, who is a very high quotient of Pinta, the Pinta gene. So they're not pure animals, but they, they're, they're the result of crosses of, of, of members of these species that are now extinct on their own islands. So what's going on here in a nutshell, it's kind of interesting is uh, we do know humans have moved tortoises around the planet a great deal over history and, and it's no different in Galapagos. As remote as Volcan Wolf is, it's a pretty famous place if you um, look up at its old name that the sailors and whalers and mariners of all different kinds used, and it's the Banks Bay. There's sea shanties about Banks Bay, but this is a big bay right off. This is Volcan Wolf in the background of this engraving, and the whalers would gather here exhausted from hunting sperm whales for a year or more or coming, um, and they would careen their ships and rest. Um, they would trade tortoises, which they've been gathering in the hundreds, 
they were known, there's records of them throwing them overboard in the, I believe in the hundreds if they'd collected too many. We're fairly sure that this is the origin of this, quite this um, mosaic of tortoises living on the lower slopes of this volcano. Um, whatever the actual, whatever happened, it was probably human, human movement. So the very people who devastated and almost destroyed them in some ways have given us the opportunity to, to, to resurrect them. And that's what you see here. So finding, it's a little bit of a, finding a needle in a haystack when you've got 12,000 endemic tortoises, but finding these, these, uh, these distinct ones in this big volcano. Um, but this is what we've been doing methodically and just to show you a, a removing these very high, um, high priority uh, tortoises with high amounts of uh, Floriana and Pinta genes in them. And this is just to show you uh, looking at uh, what it's like to we sometimes have helicopter support, sometimes we have to carry these down. This is actually two small females that um, have a very high quotient of, uh, of Floriana genes in them being loaded into the cargo net that you see here. Um, and uh, much easier to have them uh, moved um, in this manner than throwing them on your back. Um, and that's the, the, the sorry, the, I know the Spanish name, but the chingueo, the, the attachment coming down, you need to be very careful that it's very heavy, but uh, there's a helicopter up there, and this is um, just sort of uh, uh, attaching them here for their their first flight to this in this case to the ship. Um, and but we have now mo removed about 50 uh, high profile or high uh, priority tortoises um, from the the volcano um, to create this opportunity now to to build captive breeding populations um, to ultimately. Um, uh, restore tortoises on these two islands where they have long been given up as extinct. So um, this is again just the tortoises heading up. They don't seem to mind this um, heading off to the ship and uh, and we've moved about uh, again about 50 now of uh, Foriana or Pinta type tortoises um, in this manner to form up this captive rearing colony. And so that's um, these are those tortoises now on the ship. One of my jobs is sort of taking care of them, uh, and uh, for the, the days that they're aboard, uh, gets pretty crowded. Uh, on the, the ship is not particularly large, the park ship, and uh, um, and uh, you know they're on the there. This is in the in the, uh, the the lower area of the front of the hull. They're along the sides. They're on the main deck. It gets to be quite messy as well. But this is we've we've now um, secured 50 of these high priority hybrids. They're in captivity. They're doing fabulously well. Again, um, they get regular food twice a week and uh, three times a week and uh, and and water ad libitum. And they think that's pretty great compared to what they have to deal with. So they're they're very prolific in, uh, in, 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 and they thrive in captivity. And so these, we are now in the process of expanding the breeding center, uh, doubling the footprint so we can begin these captive rearing programs built around this colony of very special tortoises uh, that have the genes of those, that, uh, of those two extinct species. And so in the next few years, um, expect now it's gonna take several years to build up that inventory of five-year-old tortoises that then can be released. Uh, Floriana still has a rat, black rat problem um, and that, those, that needs to be resolved before putting tortoises out. But um, we should see these tortoises uh, with a significant part of the original genome of the, ex I guess we can't say extinct species, but uh, of their, their species. I'm actually kind of intrigued that, you know, uh, evolution will kind of shape them back again to what they once were, um, they're pretty close already. Um, but this is sort of this uh, de-extinction process is something we never anticipated, but is gonna be our uh, main, main focus now for the next uh, next decade, really. Um, so thank you. Um, I just wanted to, uh, um, there's so many more st uh, different stories to tell here, different islands and different uh, situations and problems and solutions, but uh, um, just wanted to share those highlights with you of this uh, this uh, this uh, effort really to restore these uh, these magnificent reptiles. Um, we've got uh, now looking more at this side of the graph. We we talked about this calamitous decline that happened quite some time ago, um, near extinction, and now we're in this as exciting and um, uh, as some of this effort efforts have been. It's still a 
a small step in the right direction, but for the most part, most of these populations, not all of them, are now on a steady path toward a slow recovery at the whopping rate of 1% per year of population growth, which is pretty good for tortoises, and not unlike growing timber or trees, as I, um, I think about the same, about the same rate. But um, so um, just very, very quickly here, I, again, just want to highlight uh, um, that this is basically the work of the Galapagos National Park Directorate. I'm very happy to be able to um, exercise our mission and uh, mandate for service and uh, application of knowledge to conservation, which is really how, how we're able to, to serve as the co-leader of this initiative, along with the Galapagos Conservancy. And um, so I took most of the photographs, almost all of them, not some of the very nice ones were kindly provided here. Um, by these individuals um, and just wanted to, to highlight them there. Um, and uh, Don had briefly mentioned a, a book. This is not uh, plugging a book, but just if uh, we have recently compiled, this was published in January, a, um, uh, a compendium, the first one ever of these organisms, as well as the history of the restoration of each of these species on their islands. And, and all the details are, are here in this, uh, in this recently generated um, volume. Um, but um, on that note, I just uh, want to say again, uh, I hope you found that uh, interesting application of ESFs, what we, what we do best here, application of science to, to resource management sorts of problems. And, uh, um, and uh, really, this is the sort of essence and mission of the New Restoration Science Center. And uh, of course, all supported by um, different forms of grants and, and, and donations. I know uh, Brandy, uh, Neville Dine, also an ESF alum, is, is, um, is now sort of taking the lead on this, and she's always uh, happy to, uh, to get any inquiries you might have about it. But um, just uh, on that note, uh, happy to, uh, to answer any questions you might have about the uh, presentation tonight. James, thank you very much. That was very informative. Um, and of course, we do have quite a few questions. So um, I'm just going to kind of go through them. I think we might have time to answer them all. Um, I don't want to keep everybody too long. But um, so I guess the first question was, do you have any idea of the percentage of tourism dollars that goes to the giant tortoise in conservation of the fauna on Galapagos? Yes. Well, that's a, uh, a, a, a very important question. And um, not a particularly large proportion. I mean, even the park fee that you, and that you pay, which is a very modest one, uh, about $100 to enter the park, about 15% of that goes to, to conservation. Um, but it, you know, it, uh, there are other, there's a human population with very significant needs, but uh, most of the support for conservation is from the Ecuadorian government, of basically our federal government to the park service to do this work or through non-governmental organizations like the Galapagos Conservancy, uh, Island Conservation, and frankly donations and things that these groups funnel and try to, uh, to uh, you know, to see that they're expended um, strategically, but in helping the park to, but there's not much uh, actual revenue from the tourism industry per se that goes to conservation. Okay, thank you. Um, and I know you talked a little bit about this, um, about the differences in the species and how they're geographically isolated. So somebody wanted to know, are the walls of the volcanoes the reason that the species are geographically and reproductively isolated? Is that how they speciated? Yes, no, it's, uh, those volcanoes might as well be islands. And actually in the, the just the history of sea level rise and fall, they have been islands, uh, for, but but it's interesting, the, the moist vegetation that tortoises need is really only on the flanks and the tops. And the stuff in between those volcanoes is, uh, actually goats had been present on, on Isabella Island on the southern part for uh, two or 300 years, but it only recently, 1970, were they able to cross. It's, it's un, almost uncrossable and uh, tortoises aren't the most agile. So yes, it is the very, uh, very um, new unstable lava fields that are might as well be the, the width of the Pacific Ocean between each of these uh, uh, each of these volcanoes that keeps the tortoises from moving back between them. Okay. And, and I know you mentioned this about um, them 
humans putting the tortoises in the water and maybe that's how they got there. Um, somebody was asking, is, is there any large tortoises on the mainland of South America? Well, a great question because we see giant tortoises as being these real novelties and anomalies and special things, but in fact, they were all over the planet until very recently, as in 15,000 years ago, they were the first of the Pleistocene megafauna to vanish. So there were even more gigantic tortoises. Um, there's one uh, right from the Ecuadorian mainland that, so, uh, that had a shell length of 1.5 meters, which is, um, and so these tortoises are likely the ones that, uh, that founded the Galapagos tortoise lineage, but these ones have been in Galapagos for 2 million years, but they may actually have shrunk um, and then they got to Galapagos. But the, both North America, South America, everywhere except Antarctica had uh, large numbers of giant tortoises. So it's actually a fairly recent phenomenon. And you know, I know 10, 15,000 years ago sounds like a long time, but in the, in the history of the earth, it's, it's a, a wink of an eye. They, 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 they just blinked out very, very recently. They used to be a big part of all of our faunas and, and our environments given all the things they do. Um, now you talked about how they are raised in capti captivity for five years. Um, question is, how do they do once they're not in captivity and they're not being hand fed and they're not being given water? Are they still thriving on their own? Yes, this is one part that we're rather we're rather fascinated with because usually when you raise animals in captivity, even in the best of circumstances, and you release them, if you have you know fifty percent or even people target like twenty percent survival once released is really pretty good. These tortoises we've just released these seven hundred uh, to Santa Fe Island, and they have a ninety eight percent survival rate. Um, they are tortoises; they don't need much. Um, they have a lot of, they don't need to be taught a lot, you know, um, they can kind of figure things out instinctively. Um, so in this particular case, and they do phenomenally, and there is something we don't quite understand we, why we release them at five is that for some reason their survival is actually quite low at, if you release them at age three or, or two, three or four, but then it goes, gets to be very high at five and then it stays high after. So keeping them in captivity is just, it doesn't make sense. It's a waste of resources. So, um, but there is something, but they just do extremely well, but there's something unique to giant tortoises and maybe Galapagos, maybe because they're reared right in that same environment. Their feet, they're fed many of the foods that they'll encounter in the field, which is kind of different. And, but we just uh, expect to see 50% mortality, but we, we don't really see anything at all. 98%. That's going, what we wow. see. Yeah. That's, that's a great number. <laughs> yes. um, so we did have somebody that was is asking a question about um, when we're seeing a species that is heading towards extinction from natural pressures, um, which is probably not common right now. Um, it's more probably a human influence. Um, do conservation biologists have a responsibility to still conserve them? So this is exactly the dilemma that the Fernandina tortoises po are posing. And we really don't know. There's be require us very significant investment to, to search this island for more tortoises. And then these, uh, these captive rearing programs are, are not trivial. It does cost $193 a year. It costs cost it out for each little tortoise to get through you know, all its food and water and minerals and what have you. So, but we don't really know, you know, it could be that this, uh, this, this species um, is on the brink of extinction due, due, uh, due strictly to volcanism and no human agency whatsoever. And it does raise a whole bunch of complicated issues as do we have responsibility in a very practical way. We face this in the, in the field a lot. We find tortoises in dire circumstances that just they got themselves stuck in rocks. They fell into chasms. Do we spend you know, they're injured, do we, do we, do we, do we help them? Um, do we spend the day, we, we actually spend a day trying to get a tourist out of a chasm recently and just decide it, we, we fail, but should we be doing this at all? But it's sort of the same kind of, uh, the answer is I don't, we don't know. We don't, we aren't often faced with this dilemma, but this is a, a clear one and the costs to figure out what's going on and, uh, and maybe, you know, save the species are make it all the more palpable and less, you know, less, less theoretical, uh, philosophical. But, um, and so there is no resolution at this point. Um, 
as to how to move ahead with this one species, one individual, possibly there strictly due to natural events. Um, another question about when the tortoises are in captivity, um, is there concern about disease spreading between the two groups or crossing over between the tortoise species? Um, there has not been, um, and uh, the real threat is tortoises from outside the archipelago. And this is actually, so there have been a couple of recent, very sadly, there are, these animals are tied up in some of the animal trafficking uh, industry that goes, enterprise that happens around the world. And so recently there were 120 giant tortoises that were, they were, uh, they were stolen from Galapagos, but they appeared in Peru and they were repatriated. They were, they were confiscated by the Peruvian police and, and brought, but that suddenly became a, that's a, that's a terrible situation. And, uh, and so they've actually been in quarantine at, at the airport uh, where they can be near no other tortoises for a long period of time. There are some terrible uh, tortoise diseases that, uh, especially respiratory diseases that, that are not in Galapagos that could be. But at this point, um, there has not been, we don't see a lot of disease in tortoises per se. Um, and when any of the movement of tortoises between islands is com uh, combined with deparasitism, both internal and external, but it's, it's a very important question um, given that they're all being reared together, especially the young ones in a common facility, but um, the big threat and uh, uh, quite a terrifying one is, uh, is diseases coming from outside, whether people are bringing pet turtles or whether it's this return of tortoises for very good reasons through confiscated animals, from tor Galapagos tortoises from the, from the wildlife trade. So. Um, and we had a couple of questions on the effects of climate change um, on the tortoises, um, one specifically on sea level rising. And also, this one's a little technical, um, <laughs> wants to know if they were negatively impacted by climate change with regards to temperature, sex determination, and testidines. Yes, yes. So on the first question, it's the, the, just in terms of ecosystem change, uh, sea level rise, interest, these animals do, this is why the females are so small is they have to migrate down these volcanoes to get to the shore areas to, to find soil to, to lay their nests and where it's warmer, but they actually don't go all the way to the shore. They're, they're still up uh, 100 meters or so or 50 meters. So I think the, the, that won't be a big issue, but the environment is gonna change. So we actually have looked at this and in, Galapagos is gonna get a lot wetter and warmer. So it's an arid archipelago. So there's actually going to probably be an increase in the amount of habitat because it's a it's sort of water limited xeric um, environment. Uh, in, but that's going to benefit many tortoises like the one you're looking at here, these uh, moist zone adapted tortoises, but the arid zone ones with those beautiful sculpted shells are probably not going to do so well. So it's a strange uh, um, it's probably going to need more habitat, but for some forms and not for others. Um, the temperature six determination. So for those who, that's a great question for those of you um, who don't know, these animals uh, basically have shut off, shut down their sex chromosomes in terms of they, 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 um, their, the temperature, uh, sorry, the um, sex of their offspring is determined by the temperature at which their eggs are incubated. So it gives actually females the, some options to choose the sex of their offspring. Um, and we don't know the it's a it's a it's a very important question, especially going warmer. That would if this particular these they would tend to have more female offspring at warmer temperatures. Um, but we it's it's difficult. They undergo such huge daily fluctuations in their temperatures, in their nests, um, and their. Uh, but it's something that we 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 don't know. This some of the, this kind of basic. You know we should know. Um, the thermal regimes of their nests currently and how that might be affected by, um, we are worried actually, it's part of a global change, not per se climate changes. There's a lot of, uh, there's invasive species, invasive plants um, that, especially invasive woody plants that are moving in on some of the nesting areas and actually creating a physical canopy that shades and dramatically lowers um, temperatures. But that's as uh, per, per, pernicious a problem as climate changes to these sort of lo more local ones due to invasive species. So um, something that definitely needs to be examined in more detail. We do regularly, you know, manipulate sex ratios in captivity 
I, just to get more females, just to incubate them at slightly warmer temperatures. So it's something that could actually be manipulated, but uh, if if needed. But it's not you don't you want po natural populations to sustain themselves. Um, but um, so. So we have another kind of biological question, um, not necessarily related to the Galapagos, but um, this person once read that there is an initiative to introduce Seychelles giant tortoises to Madagascar to replace one of the extinct M M Madagascar giant tortoises. So what is your feeling on, on them doing that type of uh, repopulation? Yes, that is a essence what we uh, did on, on Santa Fe with the Española tortoise, which is, but it's a much more, um, I guess it's a, it's a much more, you know, there's a clear need for a tortoise. The, the surrogate came from an adjacent island. And uh, um, I think where it gets more complicated is whether, uh, how close is that surrogate? Um, do we know that, that uh, in the case of the Seychelles and Madagascar and in that whole part, the Indian Ocean, the only other place where giant tortoises still exist only on one atoll, but there used to be a whole complex of them as well. Um, it's less clear in many cases, you know, what is the ecological prerogative? Do these really shape the ecosystem? Are they really needed? There's certainly information, uh, data that suggests, suggests they would. Um, but how well adapted are these when they're taking them from long distances in very different areas? And um, what are the motivations, you know, in, um, for, for doing these? Uh, so I, I certainly follow those and um, they're on a very small scale with just a few individuals in many cases. Um, and, but they are pushing this rewilding with, with, with different forms and different species agenda. But um, uh, it's, it is uh, moving into, I guess, a, a new world of uh, uh, where, we, where we've, with extinctions, we've lost the chance for doing restorations with you know, native endemic species. So, we may have to look at into some of these new, new approaches, um, surrogate species, but on a case by case basis. Thank you. And I know we've had quite a few comments from um, our folks that are out in the audience, thanking you for taking the time to do this presentation this evening. Um, and I think I have one last question. Um, and I know probably our students might be interested in this as well. Is are there internship possibilities to work with you um, on this? Uh, and other things within the Rest Restoration Science Center as well. Well, I'll speak on the tortoises. Yes, we are, uh, we do, uh, we are actually required to bring students on every expedition, and we do. Um, I've had many graduate students, occasionally undergrads. Um, it's complicated, uh, the, uh, but absolutely, we, we, we rely on, uh, on, on student engagement and, uh, and, and, and will. I think uh, uh, education is obviously a huge component of the Restoration Science Center as well. So, um, but uh, yes, is the okay. answer. <laughs> we love that. The hands-on learning is always a very big part of your ESF education. So um, for everybody uh, that joined us this evening, thank you very much for being with us. Um, again, if you'd like to learn more about the Restoration Science Center, please visit the uh, website that is at the bottom of your screen. It's been up for quite a while. So if you'd like to learn about the different uh, portions of the science, the Restoration Science Center, you can learn about it there. You can also make a donation to help support um, Dr. Gibbs research along with all of the other research that the center is doing. So again, um, thank you very much, Dr. Gibbs, Dr. Leopold. Um, we love having you with us um, and we really appreciate your time. So take care everybody, stay safe and be well. Thank you.